several passages of scripture I'm going to end up on, I'm going to end up on John 20 24 to 31 but I want to start with something that for many of you may be a familiar story it's the first miracle that Jesus performed it's taken from John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 on the third day there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. <clears throat> when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. I just find that completely amazing. He says, what, do you, what, would you, what does this have to do with me? My hour's not yet coming. She says, you know, moms always know sometimes. She says, do whatever he tells you to do, because she knew, I believe, that it was his time. Now there were six stone water jars. I, I want you to underline stone. Okay, these were not little water jars. These, these were large water jars, each holding between 20 and 30 gallons. They were for the Jewish rite of purification. Verse 7, Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some, some out, and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it, and when the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who drew it knew the water of the, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This is the first of his signs. Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Underline the word believed. John chapter 4. Verses 46 to 54. <clears throat> this is not long after. This is not long after that miracle at Cana. And it says, So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum there was an official whose son was ill. And when this man heard that, that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son. For he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, you need to understand, these were not megatropolis cities. Okay? Cana was not a huge place. <clears throat> and so if somebody turned gallons of water into gallons of wine, the word is going to get out. Word of mouth in a small town like that is an amazing thing. And so Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the words that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when, it be, when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed in all his household. Underline the word believe. 
This was now the second sign that Jesus did, Jesus did when he had come from Judea to Galilee. John chapter 12, verses 35 to 40. <clears throat> when Jesus had said these things, he departed and hid himself from them. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. For again Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart, and turn, and I would heal them. And then the focal pastor, uh, passage. Is John chapter 20, verses 19 to 31. This is after the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked, where the disciples, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them, and if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, Paul the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see in his hands and the mark of the nails, and place my finger into the mark of the nails, and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, the disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with, with, was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I pray your blessings on this word today. Father, we're talking about a subject that all of us has, have experienced one time or another in our lives. A point, period of time, due to circumstances or other things, where we have trouble believing. Believing your word, believing in you, putting our faith and trust in you. I pray, Father, that you would show us from your word how wrong thinking that is. We pray your spirit would be our teacher and our guide today as we study your word. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> That last passage of scripture was about a guy named Thomas who got his name from this one, one instance. When I say he got his name, he got the name that we know him by primarily from this one situation. We know him as Doubting Thomas. But he had seen Jesus heal the lame. 
He was there. It says that Jesus was there with his disciples. He was there when Jesus turned water into wine. He saw him restore sight to the blind. He was a witness to lepers being cleansed. He saw how Jesus knew people's thoughts and, 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 and challenged them on their very thoughts. He saw Jesus raise people from the dead. He saw Jesus feed a multitude with a young man's lunch. He was in the boat when Jesus walked to them on the water. He stood by as Jesus cast out demons. He heard Jesus say that the temple would be destroyed and in three days be rebuilt. And he knew he didn't mean the, the stones that stood in the city center. He knew that Jesus was talking about himself. And he was with Jesus all the way. <coughs> and yet he still doubted. Now, before we cast stones at Thomas, I want to suggest to you that, that you and I are just as bad. We know what Jesus did, and yet we refuse to believe. We have the testimony of the apostles. They didn't have the New Testament when they were seeing these things happen. It hadn't been written yet. But you and I have the testimony of all of these who were with Jesus. And we hear them say that we saw Jesus do these things. And yet we refuse to believe. We know that Jesus died on the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. And yet we want to live like it's completely up to us. We know that Jesus told us that we would be empowered by the very same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, but we still live powerless lives. Frankly, sometimes it's just too hard to believe. Why is that? I'm glad you asked. Number one, first of all, I believe that sometimes we're too afraid to believe. We're too afraid to believe. <clears throat> Listen to this. I found this story the other day. Nearly half of women in the United States fear life as a bag lady. This is actually something known as the bag lady syndrome. 46% of women suffer from what is now called this bag lady syndrome. They might have good salaries. They might have money in their purse. They might have a decent savings. They might have investments in the bank. But they're still afraid that they will wind up broke, forgotten, and destitute. Bag ladies. According to the Washington Times, a recent survey of almost 2,000 women reveals that 90% of them feel financially insecure. 46% are troubled by a tremendous fear, quote unquote, a tremendous fear of becoming a bag lady. And this anxiety actually increases as incomes rise. Among those with annual incomes of more than $100,000, almost half of them fear a life of destitution. Lily Tomlin, Gloria Steinem, Shirley MacLaine, Katie Couric have all admitted to having a bag lady in their anxiety closet. They all suffer from the bag lady nightmare. What's going on here? <clears throat> Women have complicated fears about money, observed Judith Bryles, a Denver financial advisor. I'm quoting from the article here. They fear failure or making mistakes. They fear they are expendable. Because of this, women are twice as likely as men to set aside a secret stash of money. <laughs> Two-thirds of the women surveyed said that the best thing about having money is the sense of security that it brings. Men might crave the power of status that comes with money, but women like the security of money. So let me ask you this. Are you motivated by fear or by faith? <clears throat> Listen, depending on whom you ask, 
There are somewhere around 115 instances of the phrase, fear not, in the Bible. Depending on the path, depending on the version, the translation that you use, and depending on some variation of this, but somewhere around 115 times we hear from God, fear not. Yet we allow fear to cloud our ability to trust. Even with all of the overwhelming evidence to the contrary, we still live a life of fear. <coughs> and I have to tell you that fear that leads to anxiety, fear that leads to worry, fear that locks you up and, and keeps you from moving forward in your faith, is a testimony against your faith yes. in God. Yes. Yes. You, cannot, you cannot have faith and worry in the same household. Amen. They are mutually incompatible. Amen. If you worry all the time, what you are saying by your very actions is that you do not believe God has the ability to meet your needs. Whatever those needs are. Fear. Unfounded fear. Now there's, there's some fear, you know. We have a transformer in here that breaks down electricity that comes from the pole out there. Okay. What's coming into that box is about 440 volts. Okay. I have a healthy fear of getting anywhere near a live wire there. That's a healthy fear. Okay, so some fears are good. When I get too close to the edge at the Grand Canyon, I get a little nervous. Okay, that's a healthy fear. Okay, but when you worry about things that are completely outside of your control, when you worry about things that you know God has the ability and the power to overcome in your life, then what you're saying to God is, God, I understand that you're pretty, pretty hefty guy, pretty powerful guy, but I don't think you're big enough to handle this situation, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to handle this myself. You see, fear is a testimony of a lack of faith. And I think that we sometimes are too afraid to believe. One of the things that I do, we pray for people to be healed, and sometimes they get healed, and sometimes they don't. And I, what I do not want you to hear from this is I believe that it has to do with the faith of that person. However, I do believe that is a factor. If someone comes to me asking prayer for healing, and they don't believe that God has the power to heal them, then chances are they're not going to be healed. Now, they might not be healed anyway. I think the Apostle Paul completely understood God's power to heal. And three times he asked God to remove the thorn in his flesh. We don't know what that is, but we know that it was something that, that he pleaded with God about. And three times God said no. And he learned to live with that thorn and use it as a testimony to God's power anyway. So my point in saying that is not everybody we pray for to be healed is healed. But I can tell you that if a person comes to me and says, I want to be healed, and they really don't think God has the power to heal them, then there's not a lot that I can do. I can ask God to heal them. But God wants them to demonstrate their faith. And sometimes it's just too hard to believe. Number two, we're too proud. You can't read that. We're too proud, let me give it to you, we're too proud of our own accomplishments to believe. We are too proud of our own accomplishments to believe. We live in a society today <clears throat> where independence is lauded, where independence is praised, and where people who need help are looked down upon. As Christians, we have slipped into the same routine. We work hard at our jobs and we want to be recognized for what we do. 
We are self-reliant, so we refuse the help of others. And in the process of this, we become the center of our universe. <clears throat> Jesus used this kind of person as a negative example in the parable of the Pharisee and the publican. Before we read that parable, though, what I want you to do is to understand who a Pharisee is and who a publican is. A Pharisee was one of the most influential of all the Jewish religious leaders of Jesus' day. The word Pharisee literally means the separated one or separatist. That sums up the basic nature of their beliefs. They were the strictest legalists of the day who pledged themselves to obey and observe all the countless restrictive rules, traditions, and ceremonial laws of Orthodox Judaism. <clears throat> they considered themselves to be the only true followers of God's laws, and therefore they felt that they were much better and holier than anyone else. Thus, they separated themselves not only from the non-Jews, the, the Gentiles, whom they considered Gentile dogs, but they even set themselves apart from their own Jewish brethren who did not obey the law to the extent that they did. We have some Pharisees in our churches today. Publicans, on the other hand, were considered by their fellow Jews to be the absolute worst kind of character. You see, they were tax collectors for the Roman government. These foreign occupiers had taken over the land and they hired these Jewish men to exact the taxes from the Jewish people. And they told the Jewish, or they told these tax collectors exactly how much they were required to collect the amount that was required by Rome, and then they told them, you can charge more than that, and anything you charge above that is your salary. Now, come on, honest. If you all had the opportunity to set your salary, okay, would you, would you set your salary at minimum wage? I mean, you... <laughs> okay, there's one, one honest guy over here. You know, the truth is, is they were given free license to set the tax as high as they wanted to. They had, a, they had a, um, an amount, a dollar figure that they had to give to Rome, and anything they could exact, that they could extract, that they could extort out of the people, that was their income. of their day. Amen. They were used car salesmen. That's right. Okay? So, they were despised by their Jewish brothers who considered them scum of the earth. Okay? That's the setting. Jesus tells this parable. It's found in Luke 18, 19 to 24. says this. Sorry? And yes, you're right. I'm sorry. It is. It's Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. wonder who he was talking about there. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man, talking about the tax collector, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. 
if we're not careful, we find ourselves being so proud, so puffed up, so, so glad to let the world know who we are that we can't trust God for anything. We believe that if, that if, that if, that if, if we have a need, we have the resources, we have the wherewithal, we can meet those needs. And this kind of person seldom falls on their face before God and crying out to him. But I tell you, we need more people like that tax collector in that, in that parable than we do Pharisees. We honestly need to be able to look to God and say, God, I can't do it. Because I can tell you that once you get there, the term for that is brokenness. The term for that is brokenness. And when we get to the point of brokenness, then God can use it. Isn't that just like God? You know, you have something that, that, that is whole and complete, and you say, this is a useful vessel. And God says, you need to throw it on the ground and break it into some pieces. And then I'll use it. That doesn't even make sense, does it? But God can do more out of that broken vessel than he can out of the one that's whole. Because the broken vessel then can expand and grow. That one that's whole is limited. Sometimes we don't believe because we're so proud of our own accomplishments. Number three, you can't believe because you've been betrayed in the past. You can't believe because you've been betrayed in the past. This is almost understandable. About a month and a half or two ago, I got a check in the mail. I got a check in the mail for $3,800. Wasn't a check I was expecting. And with that check, I mean, it's a real honest to goodness check. It was written on an account from Trio Farms in Bradenton, Florida. I don't know anybody in Bradenton, Florida. I don't know anybody that owns Trio Farms. But it, with this check was a letter. And this letter said, congratulations. You are one of the winners of a European lottery. And you are going to share the winnings with other people. And all you need to do is deposit this $3,000 something dollar check into the bank and then contact us and we'll tell you where to write your own check and mail it to us and when we get your check then we will send you $375,000 yeah, $375, oh more than a quarter of a million dollars what a deal. All i got to do is send them back the money they just sent me. Come on. Come on. Really? Why don't you just keep the money? Why don't you just keep the money and mail me the $375,000 check? Okay? So, this, this, this check sat on my desk for how long? A couple of months. I don't know. You know how many times I was tempted to deposit that check? <laughs> I'm serious. I would look at that and I'd say, boy, you know, I wonder if there's any way that this could possibly be true. I was beginning to believe it. But look, we've been raised to believe that if something sounds too good to be true, it probably isn't. Right? So because of that, we have been, we have been raised to be a little skeptical. Okay? I have to tell you that I was the same way. I was the same way. Listen, I knew that God sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for my sins. I knew that. I knew that God loved me. But when it came to the day-to-day -day operation of my life, I figured God was an absentee landlord. That he was too busy doing big stuff to worry about little old me. And for a long time in my life, I believed that I was, that my job was to go out there and just do the best I could, take care of myself, work hard, scratch out a living. 
And so prayer didn't mean anything to me because I didn't believe that God could do it. But the truth is we've all been burned in the past by someone or something. And that leads to that self-reliance that we just talked about. But God can play, if, if God can place the stars in space and can create subatomic particles, maybe your problems and circumstances are anywhere, aren't anywhere near too big for God. But when you believe the promises of God, then you can trust the heart of God. So here's some promises. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. This is a promise from God. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Numbers 23, 19. God is not a man that he should lie, or a son of man that he should change his mind. Has he said it, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will, will he not fulfill it? And here's one, this is one of my favorites, Proverbs. Chapter 3, 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways. That means everything you do from the minute that you wake up in the morning to the minute that you lay your head on your pillow in all your ways. Acknowledge Him. And He, He will make straight your paths. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it? Do you believe the promises of God? Do you believe the one that can bring tissue together in such a way that it creates mankind? You who have given birth to children and you've seen the miracle of that. Can you believe that a God who can make that process so unique and so beautiful, can he not meet your needs? Number four, though, you don't have enough faith to believe. I've been there. I've been there. The bottom line is that sometimes, even though we know everything we need to know, we believe all the stories of Jesus, we believe all the miracles, we believe all the teachings, we still find ourselves lacking in faith. That's a reality for all of us at one time or another. Can I just be completely honest with you? I appreciate my brother today in, in, the, in the Bible study this morning before our, before our service saying that pastors, a lot of time, when they preach a sermon, it's not because they've got it all figured out. It's because God has spoken to them as they've been in the Word, and they say, hey, look, look at what I just found. This is an answer that I needed to hear. Let me share it with you. Well, this is, this is one of those cases. There's lots of times, as your pastor... Can I just say, there's lots of times that I don't have enough faith to believe. If you think you're having a hard time with this, join the crowd. Okay? Because there are lots of times, listen, there's lots of times that, that God says something to me and I go, well, I don't think so. I mean, you may be right, God. You, you're all sovereign. I don't think so. I'm not so sure about this one. God, I, that's reality. That's reality for all of us. And, and in this process, we discover that we need more faith. There is a story in the Bible. It's found in the Gospel. Mark, 
Mark chapter 9, 17 to 27. says, someone from the crowd answered him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I ask your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. Hmm. They didn't have enough faith. <laughs> they didn't have enough faith. They were not able. And he answered them, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. <laughs> and they brought the boy to him, and when the spirit saw him, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, How long has this been happening to him? And he said, From childhood. And it has often cast him into fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I love Jesus' answer here. I love Jesus' answer here. He says, he, let me read what the, what the man said again. He said, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said this. If you can, if you can... All things are possible, underline the word all things, all things are possible for one who believes. I love this exchange between Jesus and this man. Because I, brothers and sisters, am that man. God, if you're able, if I'm able, are you kidding me? God, if you just if, if you just have the power, if I have the power, are you are you kidding me? All things are possible. Yes, all things. All things are possible. To who? To who? To those who believe. love the response of the father. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said this, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. I really do believe, but I don't have enough faith for this. I believe a lot of stuff, God, but I don't have enough faith for this. Help my unbelief. Listen, if you find yourself in that circumstance, there's only one thing you can do. If you don't have enough, then ask for more. If you don't have enough faith, then ask God to give you more faith. If you don't have enough within you, then ask God to give more of it to you. Do you understand this? This is powerful. Listen. The answer is simple. If you don't have enough faith, then ask God to give you more faith. I mean, this is, this is not rocket science here. Here's the bottom line. When you find yourself lacking faith, then declare that, that, that just declare that God is able to do all things. And if He's able to do all things, then He's able to increase your faith. <coughs> Here's a, here's, here's, a, here's, a, here's a news flash. Faith never came from you in the first place. If you declare yourself a Christian today, it's because God granted you enough faith to believe His Word to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you call yourself a Christian, then your faith came from God in the first place. So if you don't think you have enough faith, no problem. <laughs> because the faith warehouse is 
jam-packed and overflowing. And God will give you more faith if you simply ask Him for it. Amen? Since God is the source of our faith, then God is the source of greater faith. Ultimately, God will give us someday, one day, perfect faith. We're not there yet. But someday we will have perfect faith. C.S. Lewis explains it this way. I, I read this this week as I was researching for this sermon. I came across this little statement. It says, believing things on authority only means believing them because you have been told them by someone you think trustworthy. Listen to this. 99% of the things you believe are believed on authority. I believe there is such a place. Now you remember he lived in, in England. I believe there is such a place as New York. I could not prove by abstract reasoning that there is such a place. I believe it because reliable people have told me so. The ordinary person believes in the solar system, atoms, and the circulation of blood on authority because the scientists have told us so. Every historical statement is believed on authority. None of us has seen the Norman conquest or the defeat of the Spanish Armada, but we believe them because people who did see them have left writings that tell us about them. In fact, on authority. A person who balked at authority in other things, as some people do in religion, would have to be content to know nothing all his life. Listen, the testimony of those who were with Jesus, including, including Doubting Thomas, have given us the testimony of the, their eyewitness accounts. If we can believe these other things without having seen them, remember what Jesus said to Thomas at the end of that? He said, blessed are you, Thomas, who have seen and believed. Blessed are those who who have not seen and yet believe. That's you and that's me. Because you and I were never there when Jesus was on the cross. We were not physically there. You and I were not there in that upper room when Jesus appeared before the disciples and before Thomas. You and I were not there when, when, when the Apostle Paul came face to face with Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus. You and I were not there but we have the testimony of these men who, yes, brothers and sisters, who went to their very death proclaiming the truth of this testimony. Men who died martyrs' death because they defended the veracity of the words that they had written down and the words that they had proclaimed to the people. They went to their death saying, this is the truth. And if you can't believe it, then you don't need to believe the Constitution of the United States or that George Washington was the president because you can't prove it. Because you weren't there. You've got to trust somebody else's word on that. And if you can trust their words, then why can't we trust the words of the men who were there with Jesus when he said, put your hands in my side and put your hands in my hand and feet, the holes that are there. If you can't believe that, then you've got a problem that I can't help you with. And if you don't have enough faith, ask for more. <laughs> Ultimately, what you believe is based on determining how trustworthy is the one in whom you base your belief. Yes. So, this is the bottom line. When it's hard to believe, when it's hard to believe, believe God. You believe stuff your friends tell you all the time. Look, I see what you write on Facebook. I see what you write on Facebook. You believe all kinds of stuff. You believe stuff, a lot of stuff is not true. If you can believe your friends, unless you can tell me this particular friend is, is God incarnate, and you can believe that, then there's a reason why you can't believe this word of God. 
When you, when you can't believe, when it's hard to believe, believe God. Because for me, He said it, I believe it. And that's good enough for me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word today. Has it been a quick message? You unfolded it a little bit at a time to help us get to where we are. But Father, I believe there are many people in this room today. One love.